Bonsoir, mesdames, messieurs. Je suis Sylvia Brown, l'arrière-arrière petite fille de John Carter Brown et membre du conseil d'administration de cette bibliothèque. Et je suis ravie que nous avons un directeur qui est non seulement bilingue, mais grand amateur de choses françaises. Et bien entendu, je suis très excitée par le thème de l'intervention ce soir. Ladies and gentlemen, I am Sylvia Brown, the great-great-granddaughter of John Carter Brown and a member of the board of this library. And I'm thrilled that our director is not only bilingual, but a great, uh, has a great love for things French. And of course, I'm very excited by the theme of our talk tonight. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Neil Safir. Merci, Sylvia. Uh, thank you all and welcome. Uh, as um, uh, Sylvia mentioned, uh, this is a very special uh, night and occasion. Uh, it is the occasion of our annual Sonia Galetti lecture. Uh, it, it, some of you may have noticed that we didn't have a Sonia Galetti lecture last year. Uh, that was because there was a blizzard last year. <laughs> some of you may recall the long winter. And uh, indeed, the uh, evening, uh, the exactly one year after the date last year of the Sonia Galetti lecture, there was another blizzard this year. And I'm very glad that we did not invite Francois Furstenberg back on that day to give the Sonia Galetti lecture. In any case, uh, I'm thrilled to welcome you all here this evening. Uh, one of the privileges of this library is that not only is it a, an extraordinary collection and an amazing uh, and spectacular, in many ways, research center, it also becomes, on nights like this, a cultural center, uh, a center for the materials and the cultures of those books, maps, and prints uh, that we preserve and of the countries whose cultural patrimony uh, we uh, are the, proud to be stewards of. So tonight, uh, I'm thrilled to inaugurate what will become really a year dedicated to the history of France, the Americas, and the globe. This uh, 2016 happens to be the 250th anniversary year of the circumnavigation of the first printed account, anyway, or the circumnavigation of what is meant, what is thought to be the first Frenchman to uh, to go around the globe. That is Louis Antoine de Bougainville. Uh, the reason that I say thought to be is that a very precocious member of our Board of Governors told me that in fact he was not the first Frenchman <laughs> to circumnavigate the globe, and that he himself has the manuscript account to prove it. Now I have not, being the uh, 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 historian that I am, I have not yet seen the documents, and so I don't necessarily believe him, but I do want to give deference to the possibility. Um, in any case, uh, this event is the kickoff for that year of celebrations. We are also going to be holding a special forum on the life and work of Gilbert Chinard later, on, later this year, a tremendously important uh, scholar, uh, French scholar, who studied the history of the Americas. Uh, in November, we will be holding a symposium on the Jesuit relations in uh, conjunction with Northeastern University, Boston College, and several international partners uh, uh, based on a digitization project that they are engaged in. And finally, at the end of this year, we will be holding a special exhibition uh, on France in the globe, building on the 250th anniversary of Bougainville, as well as our earlier bicentenary celebration in, let's see, what it was, uh, 25 years, um, I'm sorry, in, 19, in 1989. I was trying to think that if this would might be 25 years after that original celebration, but in fact it's a little bit later. In any case, we are uh, very grateful uh, in particular to the Florence Gould Foundation, which has given us uh, funds to support all of these activities um, this year. And there is a sign-up sheet that is around somewhere um, that if you would like to be apprised of these activities, and particularly the French activities, please make sure and sign up before um, this night is over. Uh, 
In addition to holding events, we are also acquiring books related to the history of France. As most of you know, the library has the special privilege of continuing to acquire materials in all of the areas of its collection. And so over on this, uh, in this display case uh, behind you, um, our curator of European books, Dennis Landis, has put together a very small selection of some of the most uh, interesting French language materials that we have acquired recently. Uh, one of my favorites is entitled Les Entretiens des Cafés de Paris, which is a set of entretien or interviews, conversations uh, that took place in, uh, in uh, well, fictional conversations, so we're not sure that they actually took place, but this was at the beginning of the 18th century on a whole variety of different themes, um, some of which include references to tobacco, of course, a very important American commodity, as well as uh, Mexico, Peru, and other topics. So for that reason, um, this is something that uh, will find it a very welcome place in our collection and was just acquired by the library about two weeks ago. Uh, we also have materials uh, including geographical materials and botanical uh, uh, materials and so we welcome you to take a look at those. Uh, we are also focused on digitizing our French language imprints as well. And so increasingly, you will be able to find and be able to recommend to your friends who don't live in Providence uh, the, uh, our website, which ha will increasingly have more and more material uh, related to our French uh, collection. Um, if there is a particular uh, item from the collection that you individually would like to be associated with, we even have an opportunity now for you to have a digital book plate attached to that object. Um, and I, I have a few um, uh, brochures that explain the process around which uh, we, are, we are doing this. We're very proud of this program because what it essentially does, it, is, it allows anyone who would like to participate in our digitizing the collection and then it is available worldwide free of charge for anybody who would like to have um, a version of that, uh, of that object. Um, so tonight uh, we celebrate uh, the Galetti Lecture, which has become, as I mentioned, an annual tradition at the library. And this honors um, uh, someone whom we have the fortune to have with us uh, this evening, Sonia Galetti. Uh, Sonia, as many of you know, was a longtime volunteer at the library for approximately 20 years and who, um, uh, who the, whom the library decided to honor because of that important work that she was involved with. Uh, she has since then, um, and uh, together with her late husband, um, continued to support this uh, fine institution. And we normally like to uh, uh, give the opportunity to speak to someone who has written a book that uh, is, goes beyond the academic realm and that speaks to interests th uh, that um, are uh, more perhaps manageable or perhaps more uh, comprehensible to a much uh, broader audience. Uh, we're, ha we're very fortunate tonight to have somebody who has written uh, not only one of those books but two, um, and that is uh, Francois Furstenberg. Francois is a professor of history at Johns Hopkins University, uh, not only his alma mater for the PhD, but mine as well. Indeed, I had the privilege of meeting Francois when we were both uh, early on in our graduate student career and have continued to follow his uh, career as I uh, developed my own. Uh, and uh, we've had the great fortune of being in many similar places uh, at times from Baltimore to Paris and being able to share in the development and elaboration of many, uh, many different projects. Francois has, um, uh, as I mentioned, uh, most recently published this, uh, the book from which tonight's talk will be given, When the United States uh, Spoke French, uh, which uh, won a very important prize from the Society of uh, the Early American Republic. Uh, but he also published earlier another prize-winning book, 
um, whose name I am now forgetting, but I will remember, uh, which is in the name of the father, Washington's legacy, slavery, and the making of a nation. Uh, Francois's work has consistently challenged the borders of, of, of uh, several different very uh, central uh, questions of uh, North American history related to, in the first instance, the history of slavery and the dichotomy between slavery and freedom, and in terms of this second uh, project, the geographical underpinnings of this uh, uh, particular um, uh, of, of the nation that, um, and, the, and the people who really contributed to its development. So um, I very much look forward to, in fact, I've been looking forward to over, from over a year to this uh, lecture tonight, um, uh, and, uh, and I'm sure you will all be uh, thrilled to hear it. Before I invite Francois to the podium, there are just two other things I would like uh, to do. Um, uh, the one is, once again, uh, to recognize Sonia Galeri for being here. Um, and to thank her for providing such a wonderful opportunity uh, for us. Um, the second is to thank the staff of the library, um, especially uh, Brenda de Santiago and Maureen O'Donnell, but I know uh, uh, you all uh, know that you share tremendously. We, we work in a, an extreme, extremely collaborative environment here. Uh, we're very fortunate to have uh, people on the staff who are not only professional, but also very much willing to help out with one another uh, in order to bring uh, these uh, outstanding events to pass. So uh, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Francois Fersenberg. Well, um, thank you, Neil, for that introduction. Let's see if I can do this without sp spilling water on some equipment here. Um, thank you for that introduction. Um, I'm really delighted to be here for this long, uh, long-awaited talk, as as, uh, as Neil mentioned. And thanks also to to Maureen and to Brenda um, and to Kim for pulling the books today, and the whole staff at the um, at the library here, um, and um, and for having me here for this very impressive turnout on a rainy Monday afternoon. And I have to say that it's really, it's really um, exciting for me to be here, not just, because, um, not just because I get to speak at the John Carter Brown Library, but also because I get to see, see Neil in his um, still relatively new position at the helm of this, um, of this really venerable institution. And, and so this gives a, a particular thrill to, to me. I've known Neil, as he mentioned, for a really long time. And it seems like such a nice fit for, for Neil and for, the, um, and for the library. So um, as, Neil, I'm gonna be, uh, as Neil mentioned, I'm going to be talking about um, about the book, uh, my last book here, which, which came out um, a year and a half ago or so, um, and uh, which is, you know, I think very much in the vein of the, of the John Carter Brown Library, looking at sort of intersections between, uh, between the history of Europe and, and the history of, um, of the Americas. And the book, I think, looks at something of a, uh, of a hidden history, as I, as I think about it. Today, uh, French-U.S. relations tend to be usually somewhat, um, somewhat tense. We've all lived through the age of, of freedom fries, cheese-eating surrender monkeys. It's easy to forget that, that relations weren't always this way. France was the United States' first and its greatest ally. Its intervention in the American Revolution had secured U.S. independence. The French knew that, and Americans at the time knew that. When the French Revolution broke out, Americans could hardly have been more excited. The most powerful monarchy in Europe had suddenly fallen to its knees. And I think today it's really hard to capture the, the excitement, the, the, the stunning surprise of, of, of this moment. You have to think of kind of, I don't know, May 1968, uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall, the Arab Spring, the, the nomination of Donald Trump to the, to the Republican uh, presidency, all these astonishing, truly unimaginable events all rolled up into one spectacular moment. And best of all, Americans th thought that they had started it all. In 1792, France became a republic. The excitement in the United States reached a frenzy. Everywhere, I have some animated slides here, everywhere there were uh, parades, Celebrations, huge gatherings with thousands of people marching in the street, singing La Marseillaise or Ça ira, 
or other French revolutionary songs, wearing the French uh, revolutionary cocard of the cockade. Every July 14th, throughout the 1790s, Americans would gather for huge demonstrations. They would listen to sermons on the momentous events in France, give toasts in political clubs. It really is hard to, to recapture the excitement of this moment. In January of 1793, King Louis XVI was executed. Aristocrats began to be massacred in the streets of, of Paris, and thousands of them fled, including many to the United States. And so I wrote a book about five of these, um, of these refugees, of these political refugees, on their American adventure. And so I want to talk about them this afternoon, this evening, as a way of kind of looking at or thinking about early American history through, through a you know, different and I think somewhat unfamiliar set of eyes. So the research that, that led to this book um, has a, a long history to it. I grew up here in the United States, but I spoke French at home. My mother's French, um, and so it was my sort of native one, co-native language. Actually, my mother's here tonight. She's, um, I can't say that I was particularly drawn to French history. Uh, I did my, um, my PhD, my dissertation in American history. I wrote my first book, as, as Neil mentioned, on George Washington's image. And I see somehow someone managed to even secure a few copies of the book back there. If you guys, if you guys buy it tonight, you'll double the sales of that book. <laughs> then in, um, in 2003, I moved to Montreal to start teaching history at the University of Montreal, the Université de Montréal, a francophone institution. And, um, you know, I mean, I think, I don't know, so sometimes we like to think that our work has um, some connection to our intellectual commitments, and no doubt, um, no doubt it does. But I don't know how often we sort of admit or think about um, that, you know, our scholarship is kind of the result, oftentimes, of, of sort of luck or, or, you know, somewhat arbitrary factors. I suddenly found myself in a, in a corner of America that actually did speak French. I was teaching American history to Francophone students in a department that was mostly focused on the history of, of Canada, of New France, and of, and of Quebec. And so I thought it would be kind of fun and interesting for me to, um, to connect the United States to its, its own French heritage, a way of kind of connecting my own research interests with that of my colleagues and of my students. And um, this was, you know, this was an auspicious time, I guess, to begin. I was fortunate again. It was an auspicious time to begin um, a research project like this one. This was a time when American histories, Amer many American historians were really busy broadening the field of American history. Now, I'm sure the audience here would never know this. The, the John Carter Brown Library is such a cosmopolitan place. You're used to thinking of the history of the Americas, of crossroads between Europe and, um, and all of the Americas, intersection movement, all these things. But you can take my word on this. Um, the view from the provinces uh, looks, uh, or at least used to look, quite different. Many American historians had, had long taken a pretty narrow view of American history. They'd used the nation as the primary frame of reference, and this was the kind of national borders continued to dominate, even um, in you know, what we call the colonial period before the nation even existed. And so that was really changing when I began the research for this book. Many, Amer many eminent historians had thrown themselves into the field of Atlantic history. We have one here, Jack Green, who was really a pioneer um, in this field. They were connecting what, you know, what had been called colonial American history to broader connections between America, um, Europe, Africa. Others were going even further. They were globalizing American history, setting it in the broadest possible context of world history. They were connecting American history to uh, the histories of other nations, other peoples. So just as I was beginning the research for this book, I learned, for instance, that Benjamin Franklin had been a European, not an American. And this seemed to open up all kinds of opportunities for new research. And um, I mean, over the course of my previous research, I'd run across the five main characters of this book in, you know, just kind of in my reading. These were famous aristocrats from France, and they were sort of hanging out with, um, with each other in Philadelphia and with some major American figures, people like George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Alexander Hamilton. And these, these Frenchmen had all been really centrally involved in the French Revolution. And yet, here they were in the United States, living in the American capital, traveling through the country. They seemed wildly out of place. It was as though they hadn't sort of gotten the memo. They'd forgotten that they were supposed to belong to French history, not to American history. And um, here they were. So, so what were they doing here, I wondered? What, um, what, what were these adventures? Could they offer us a new way of thinking about American history? I'd first kind of imagine a small little project, a short book. I was tired from my last book. I wanted a little book on Philadelphia, maybe 100 pages or something like that. Um, 
but it, it gradually began to expand far beyond that. It took me beyond um, Paris and Philadelphia through London into the Caribbean and eventually deep into the American continental interior. It grew beyond the five aristocrats who I had started to focus on to include bankers in Amsterdam, slaves in Haiti, aristocrats in London, Native Americans in the Ohio Valley, naturalists in Charleston, backcountry settlers in Kentucky, and many more. All of these people and many others, it turned out, were inseparable from the stories of my five French aristocrats. So why don't I introduce you to these, um, to these main characters. The first, um, the first figure who I looked at, and sure, surely the most famous today, is um, Talleyrand, who was a former French archbishop, sat in the Constituent Assembly, and proposed the nationalization of church lands. He would go on to become France's longest serving and uh, most famous foreign minister, reshaping, largely reshaping the map of Europe in the 19th century. He was the, the wittiest character. He was by far the, the most observant, I would say. Always ready with a terrific quip. Um, in many ways, he was the sort of the most useful character for me, and I always had to kind of resist his gravitational pull and, and end up having this book be fundamentally about him. Then there was uh, Louis-Marie, the Vicomte de Noailles. He was married to the daughter of his first cousin, as, as often happened, um, whose sister, Adrienne, had married Lafayette. So he was Lafayette's brother-in-law. Like, like Lafayette, he'd been inspired by the American Revolution. He wanted to come over, but unlike Lafayette, his father was still alive and forbade him from coming over. Lafayette had the good fortune, I suppose, of, of having lost his parents, so he was able to just sail over. Um, Noailles had to wait until France formally declared war, and he, he came over during the American Revolution with Rochambeau's forces, and, and um, actually there's a kind of local connection here. He spent about a year in Newport, Rhode Island, uh, where he lived with a, a family of Quaker merchants called the, the Robinson family. There's a terrific correspondence, actually, that you can find online. I'm happy to share it with anybody. Um, Quakers were sort of charmed by the manners of this French aristocrat. He participated in the siege of Savannah uh, and at Yorktown, where he represented the French government in Cornwallis's surrender. After the revolution, he, he returned to France, where he um, served in the army. Actually, Napoleon served as an officer under him. Became a major figure in reform, liberal reform circles. It was he, actually, who presided over the French Constituent Assembly on the, the famous night of August 14th, 1789, when feudalism was formally abolished. He was brave and dashing. He was a knowledgeable soldier and one of the, most, one of the finest dancers at Versailles. He was said to be Marie Antoinette's frequent dance partner. The third character was the Duc de La Rochefoucauld Liancourt, who was one of the wealthiest aristocrats of old regime France. He'd served as the master of the king's wardrobe. And I want to, I should pause for a minute here just to say these aren't sort of garden variety aristocrats. I mean, these are people who are descending from the very, the very summit of France's noblest families, part of what they call the nobility of the sword, not the nobility of the robe. So as master of the king's wardrobe, it was Liancourt who famously burst in the king's bedchambers on the night of July 14th, 1789, to tell him of the uprising in Paris. Is it a revolt? The king asked. Non, sire, c'est une révolution, Liancourt famously replied. By the time that he arrived in the United States, he'd lost his entire fortune. He'd seen his cousin executed. He was the, the most introspective um, figure of the, of the crowd. He was sort of brooding, often depressed, what we would call today depressed. He went around the country traveling here and there. He wrote, he wrote about his travels in eight volumes, which are uh, here at the JCB. Here's a copy of the, of, of the, the first volume. Um, at the John Carter Brown Library. His, his dog was actually his closest traveling companion as he went around the country. Then there was uh, Volney, who was a traveler and philosophe, a famous uh, writer and future senator. He was probably the deepest thinker of the group, certainly the most intellectual. He would go on to be a renowned scholar of the Orient and of the ancient world. He was interested in philosophy and politics, natural history, and many other subjects. Here's his account of his travels in the United States, which he published um, when he returned to, uh, to, the, um, to Paris after, um, after the events had calmed down. This, one, this copy is also in the, in the um, collection of the JCB here. And then finally was um, Moreau de Saint-Méry, who was a lawyer and a historian. He'd been um, born in the Caribbean, married into a wealthier, wealthy planter family, and gone on to um, Paris to write about the Caribbean and to enter politics. I sort of grew most attached to, to Moreau, I think. He was the only actually non-aristocrat of the, of the group. He was short and pudgy. His belly is actually even depicted in, his, in this portrait. 
Um, he writes about losing his, his belly as he sailed over um, and, and lacked for food and gained it back. He, he really wore his insecurities on his sleeve. He was always trying to prove himself fit for this eminent company in which he, um, in which he socialized. So these, um, four of them anyway, were aristocrats, but they were all liberals. They admired the United States and its constitution, and they hoped to implement a constitutional monarchy in France. When the revolution began, they became its leaders. All five of them sat in the Constituent Assembly, which produced the first, the first constitution in French history. Had history taken a different path, they would today be remembered as France's founding fathers. But that wasn't the path that history took. With King Louis XVI opposing the new constitution, war between France and its enemies broke out. Austrian and Prussian armies bore down um, on, on Paris, invaded France, and politics took a sharp turn left. The monarchy was overthrown, the king was executed, and the liberal aristocrats fled. Many of them went first to England, where, uh, but when war broke out between France and Britain, they, uh, they were chased across the Atlantic all the way to Philadelphia. The emigres um, came at a time when the United States was nothing like the power it is today. It takes a leap of imagination, I think, to picture the country as it was then, weak, fragile, a collection of 13 states huddled along the Atlantic coast, riven by divisions, continually under siege by native and foreign powers. Today, the United States is a continental and even a global power. Back then, its sovereignty extended from the Atlantic coast to the Appalachian Mountains with a few fingers jutting into Kentucky in Tennessee. The heart of the Atlantic economy lay to the south, in the Caribbean. That was Europe's main interest in the Americas, the islands that produced such rich stores of sugar, coffee, indigo, and other commodities that powered the Atlantic economy. Protecting those Caribbean islands was a major reason that France had intervened in the American Revolution. In fact, it was probably the major reason. American harbors would provide bases for French naval operations in the Caribbean. American resources like lumber and wheat would supply the French sugar colonies as they had formerly supplied the British. But the French Revolution soon spilled over into the Caribbean. Shortly after revolution exploded into France, insurrection broke out in Saint-Domingue, today's Haiti. In 1791, slaves in the north began a rebellion that soon turned into a revolution against slavery itself. Under the brilliant leadership of Toussaint Louverture, Haitian forces fought off French planters, invading Spanish forces, and the British Navy, three of the greatest powers of the age. The Haitian Revolution would upend the Atlantic economy and the labor regime on which it depended. And it would bring tens of thousands of refugees pouring into the United States. And so it was in the midst of all this sort of political ferment and migration that my aristocratic emigres arrived in the United States, and all of them settled in Philadelphia. So uh, why did they come to Philadelphia? Well, first of all, it was the country's principal port, the most connected to France and the French Caribbean. It exported wheat, lumber, and other goods from the Delaware Valley, already known then as America's breadbasket, North America's breadbasket, shipping them out to the Caribbean and across the Atlantic to Europe. It was the country's mercantile capital, imports of sugar, coffee, indigo, and other commodities coming in from the Caribbean and being reshipped across the Atlantic to Europe. With trading links to uh, Asia, French ports as far away as Pondicherry in India, luxury goods began pouring into the United States, and Philadelphia became the country's consumption capital. It was the country's financial capital as well, where the first bank of the United States had been founded, just a few blocks away from where the emigres lived on, on Third Street. I don't know if all of you can see the screen over here, but I'm really proud of these before and after pictures that I got. The, on the left is Russell Birch's uh, watercolors of, of Philadelphia in the 1790s, and on the right is my own um, attempt to replicate these, uh, the images that he did. It was the city's cultural capital. It was the country's cultural capital as well, the site of the library company, which had been founded, famously founded by Benjamin Franklin. I know we don't like to talk about the library company here. Sorry, Neil. Um, Today, this building houses the American Philosophical Society, an organization that actually inducted several of my emigres in the 1790s. And then, of course, Philadelphia was the nation's political capital. Here's um, a picture of Congress Hall, where Congress sat 
in the 1790s, the House of uh, Representatives downstairs, the Senate upstairs, and I hope you particularly appreciate this shot that I got here. I was almost arrested by, um, by a security guard while I was trying to get it. <laughs> Philadelphia was, in short, the country's political capital, cultural capital, and economic capital all rolled into one. It was the only time that the United States had a single great metropolis the way that France has Paris or England has London. But of course, Philadelphia was a very different city then from what it is now. It had a population of approximately 40,000 people, roughly the size, when you think about it, of a large American university, not even in the top 10, actually, of American universities. It was tiny. It was uh, virtually the entire population was huddled along the banks of the Delaware River. The size, the size of the of settled Philadelphia at the time was roughly half the size of the University of Rhode Island campus. And it was incredibly dense. Uh, a density of 17,000 people per square kilometer. So that's much denser than Philadelphia is today, much denser than Manhattan even is today. To find that kind of population density, you have to look all the way to Bombay. Although, of course, it's much, much, uh, much smaller than that. And into this um, small city, uh, thousands of French people poured into this mix. It's never been um, possible for me to get exact figures, but on the very low end, it would have been a very minimum of 3,000 French people who came to Philadelphia in the 1790s, and as many as 8,000 on the high end of the estimates. So we're talking about somewhere between 8 and 20 percent of Philadelphia suddenly speaking French. Now keep in mind, this is very much of a kind of face-to-face -face city. Think about 40,000 people living on an area the size of a sort of medium-sized university campus. Think of, I don't know, the Penn State population on uh, a, a campus one quarter, maybe one fifth of its size. You can easily walk the city, you'll recognize faces, recognize people, and so on. And so the sudden arrival of, of three to 8,000 French-speaking people is, is an event. Um, it will transform the city. And eventually, it will transform the country. With these waves of refugees pouring into the city, Philadelphia was transformed. French wine and silk and mustard arrived from distant ports. Merchants built, built, uh, built grand houses in French neoclassical style and filled them with refined French furniture, ornate French tapestries, and exquisite gobelin porcelain. The aroma of French food wafted through the alleys behind South 2nd Street, including the delicacies prepared by Marino, a pastry chef who'd once, once worked in the French court at Versailles. French revolutionary songs performed nightly in the Chestnut Street Theater echoed off the city's cobblestones. Madame Mercier, who'd studied with Marie Antoinette's hairdresser, opened a shop catering to Philadelphia's transnational clientele. French silversmiths, French dentists, French dance instructors all applied their services. French language rang out on Philadelphia's streets in its most refined social spaces. French newspapers, French bookstores, French taverns all shaped the city's cosmopolitan public sphere. In short, it really did seem for a time as though uh, the United States spoke French. In the heart of this little neighborhood, my five emigres lived together. They ate together. They socialized together. They forged the most intimate of connections. Every day that he was in Philadelphia, according to, to Moreau, Talleyrand would drop by in the evenings. We opened our hearts to one another. We poured out our feelings, and each of us knew the other's most intimate thoughts. Talleyrand ate nearly every day at, the, um, at a Franco-Dutch banker's house, most likely because uh, the banker employed a French chef. The United States are a country where if there are 32 religions, there's only one dish, Tadiran commented. And it's a bad one, he added. <laughs> Moreau's bookstore was a fascinating place. It wasn't just a center of sociability, it was also a center of French language publishing in, in the city. With the help of a printer who'd fled from Saint-Domingue, Moreau published a French language newspaper and dozens of books in both French and English during his time in Philadelphia. He published his own monumental work on the French and Spanish parts of Saint-Domingue, which scholars still use um, as an important source today, and which uh, the library here today has, uh, has several, many copies of. Here's, here's one um, up on the screen. Moreau also published works by his friends, including a small book on Philadelphia's prison by Lyoncourt. A uh, copy of that is here. <coughs> and you can see Moreau uh, you know, published uh, at Moreau's bookstore in Philadelphia. In fact, you have uh, here the JCB has 17 titles which were published by Moreau in, um, in Philadelphia. But Moreau wasn't just a printer, he was also a, a bookseller, carrying works from across the Atlantic world in French um, uh, and uh, English to American and foreign customers in Philadelphia. Here's the first of his 72-page catalog of books and other materials that were for sale. 
Moho was particularly interested in scientific tracks. Here's a publication of a book uh, by Isaac Newton along with another 18th century chemistry text. He sold books in English and French, of course, also Latin, Spanish, Italian, German, Dutch. He sold maps, almanacs, pens, quills, and stationery. He even claimed to have introduced condoms to the United States. I carried a complete assortment of them for four years, he wrote, and while they were primarily intended for the use of French colonials, they were in great demand among Americans, he bragged. All of this gives us a sense, I think, of how incredibly cosmopolitan a place Philadelphia was at the time, and I don't uh, just mean in terms of condoms. I challenge, um, I challenge anyone in this room to find a, a bookstore today in the United States that carries books in English, French, Latin, Spanish, Italian, German, Dutch. I don't think even Neil can read all those languages. I've studied American history for, um, you know, for about 20 years now, and for me, this sort of thing is just uh, stunning. It gives a whole new perspective, I think, on Philadelphia and, in fact, on the United States. During my research, I came to realize that the 1780s and the 1790s, this period between the American Revolution um, and the diplomatic collapse of the late 1790s, this is a largely forgotten moment, I think, when the United States was most turned towards the world in general and towards France in particular. Many of the greatest merchants in Philadelphia had grown fabulously rich off trade with France and the French Caribbean. We're talking about legendary Philadelphia families like the Binghams, the Chews, the Shippings, the Willingses, the, Morris, the Morrises. Historians refer to this um, time as the, uh, age of the, the era of the Republican court, which orbited around the George Washington administration. And I tried um, in, my, in my research to get inside these homes to explore the look and the feel of these social spaces. The center of Philadelphia's social life in the 1790s was the home of Anne and William Bingham. Their, um, their mansion is pictured here. Along with Moreau's shop, it served as the social center, as a social center for elite French Philadelphia. The, the building, the mansion, had been modeled on the Duke of Manchester's house in London. It was known then as the Hereford House. It's on the right here. When the Binghams visited London in the 1780s, they had seen the mansion and decided that they would build a replica in Philadelphia only a little bit larger. They even shipped back some of the stonework from the masons who'd uh, worked on the house in London. The portico um, on the right was added a bit later. At the time, it would have been really identical. The building, um, that building, the Hereford House, still stands in London, so some of you may actually have been inside of it. It houses the Wallace Collection today, so if you've ever visited the Wallace Collection, you've been inside the sort of replica of the Bingham House. Um, the Bingham House uh, no longer exists, or I should say the model of the Bingham House. The Bingham House no longer exists. It burned in a fire in the 1820s or 30s. Um, but we know a lot about the inside from contemporary descriptions. And you know, few people who visited the mansion failed to write about it, describe it in, you know, in often vivid detail. Of course, it's impossible to visit today. So I did the next best thing that I could. I went to London, and I visited the, um, its model. I walked around the interior to compare it with contemporary descriptions of, um, of the Bingham House in order to see um, how the spaces would have, uh, inside the Bingham House, would have sort of felt and looked in the 1790s when my emigres arrived. So a staircase, I'm quoting here from descriptions of the Bingham House, a staircase of Italian marble, wide enough for plants and flowers on either side, curved up from the vestibule of the ground floor into upstairs rooms, into saloons, decorated with Gobelin tap tapestry, and reflecting mirrors. When the Binghams returned from their travels abroad, they brought from Europe, according to one of their acquaintances, everything for the house and table which the taste and luxury of the times had invented. Bingham was so proud of the spaces that he'd created in his house, he had himself painted right inside his mansion, next to all the columns um, and marble of the, of the building. As in the British model, the Binghams added all the neoclassical touches that were so fashionable in Europe at the time, made popular by the Scottish architect Robert Adam. And they decorated it lavishly. Downstairs was the dining room, papered in the French taste, according to one visitor. They brought mirrors, armchairs, and fashionable sedan chairs in the form of lyres. In France, they bought carpets, textiles, gobelin tapestry to drape their sofa, a 350-piece set, set of Sevres china, 200 pieces of silver tableware, 206 drinking glasses. The furniture was, according to another visitor, elegant, even superb. The rooms upstairs were adorned with painted ceilings, 
Brilliant silk curtains, French arabesque wallpaper by the famous Jean-Baptiste Réveillon, painted in red, blue, yellow, and green. Now, keep in mind that Bingham had made his fortune off of trade between the Caribbean, Philadelphia, and Europe. And so to look at these pictures, to look at these um, spaces, is to, uh, is to sort of understand, or at least to be reminded, of the wealth that Caribbean trade produced. I mean, this is why the Caribbean was so unbelievably important uh, at the time. It was in these spaces that Philadelphia's French-oriented elite socialized and politicked, and it was in these spaces that my French emigres integrated themselves into American life. In fact, no, I even lived in the Bingham house for several years. Volney gave French lessons to the Bingham girls. And so these people were, um, they were quickly incorporated into the country's most elite social networks. For Philadelphians, they were a real prize, these, these um, emigres, these Frenchmen, as conversant with the norms of the Versailles court life as they were with the sparkling conversation in Paris's legendary salons. They were poised to enchant Philadelphia, uh, and Philadelphia's elites in particular, connecting their provincial salons and teas to the glitter of the European aristocracy. This was one of the great paradoxes of the period. If these, if these French revolutionaries had sought in 1789 and 1790 to emulate men like Washington, Jefferson, and Franklin, these noble, virtuous figures as they saw them, who'd led a revolution and drafted a successful constitution, they arrived in the 1790s a few years later to an America, uh, to an America where Philadelphians were busy trying to ape the manners of the Versailles court. The emigres were immediately bombarded with invitations to suppers, dinners, balls, to any social event where they could spice up an evening. A dense web of networks soon knit the emigres into American life. And the more I looked at them, the more interested I became in, in how these networks functioned. Now, you know, we all talk about networks these days, sociologists, historians, everyone. Um, everyone's rushing in. It's probably not a coincidence that this is the age of the social network. I was once accused of doing kind of Facebook history, which is probably, um, probably perhaps true. Not nice, but true. I came up um, with this image in the book. I spent a little while trying to, trying to sort of, I have, actually I downloaded some software at one point, you know, so, sort of ma network mapping software. It didn't, it didn't really work for me. So I decided to try a more uh, sort of art artisan approach. I, I tried to create this image of the book to kind of illustrate how these social networks are functioning, who was introducing who, who met who, who was connected with who through, um, through and so on. Um, sort of trying to figure out what they would have looked like, these networks that integrated the French emigres into American life. Now these connections were forged by various elements. One of the most um, important and interesting to me was uh, letters of introduction. I, I write about them in the book and I could, I could bore you all evening talking about these letters of introduction. It's a fascinating kind of genre, sort of form of correspondence. Of course there was friendship, business partnership, economic relationships were absolutely central. Marriage and kinship were one of the most important links, links surely in these transatlantic ne networks. One of Talleyrand's companions was, uh, had married into the family of Henry Knox, who was then the Secretary of War. Another one married into the uh, wealthiest merchant family in Philadelphia. Now there are lots of stories that I, um, that I uh, discuss in the book, but my favorite one that kind of illustrates the way these kind of family and merchant um, and economic networks all sort of overlapped is um, a story about a young French banker named Pierre César Labouchère. And now Labouchère was a was a, a young Frenchman who who grew up and was born in France. And he was um, at a young age he was he began serving as a clerk in the Hope Bank of Amsterdam. And the Hope Bank this is in the 1780s and 1790s was the major uh, bank of Europe at the time. You have to think I don't know Goldman Sachs and J.P. Morgan packed into one. Um, they were loaning money to governments and to kings around uh, around Europe. And at the time they were beginning to forge a closer and closer uh, relationship with the Bering Bank in London. Bearings were emerging as one of the major powers of finance, of European finance, um, which they would become in the 19th century. And so they sent um, this young clerk to work in the, uh, in the Bering Bank in London. And uh, while he was there, he, he began courting the daughter of Sir Francis Bering, who was the founder and the head of the Bering Bank. So um, evidently things were going quite well. And so he went, approached uh, Sir Francis Bering, and he said, uh, I would like your permission to, to marry your daughter. And Sir Francis Bering sort of looked at him and he said, you know, you can't marry my daughter. You're just the clerk in the whole bank. And, uh, and so La Boucher asked, he said, listen, if you knew that I was about to become a partner in the Hope Bank, would it change your opinion? And Bering said, well, you know, I, I suppose, yeah, it, pr it probably would. So with that, he rushed back to Amsterdam, and, and he, he went and he saw the hopes, and he said, I want to be a partner in the bank. And they said, you can't be a partner in the bank. You're, you're just a clerk here. Uh, and he said, well, would it change your opinion if you knew I was about to marry Sir Francis Bering's daughter? 
Um, and believe it or not, this actually worked. He became a partner in the bank and became Baring's uh, son-in-law. So, so these are the ways that these kinds of, um, of, of networks uh, uh, functioned. And so as this um, La Boucher story suggests, these networks had important economic components. And these um, economic components would shape the emigres' experiences while they were in the United States. Through these networks, the emigres turned their attention to land. The 1790s were a time of um, frenzied and reckless speculation in land, and the emigres launched themselves into it headfirst. And so this is sort of the last part of the research that I did, and last part of the talk tonight, don't worry. To assess um, various investment opportunities, the, the um, emigres toured, uh, spent a lot of time touring the, the back country, the American back country, traveling deep into the Ohio Valley, across upstate New York and northern New England, and down the Appalachian hinterlands. The emigres' networks, which stretched through the French nobility and among liberal uh, aristocrats across European capitals, it provided them, these networks provided them with privileged access on both sides of the Atlantic, it made them ideally positioned to channel flows of capital into the United States. Now this was um, really the most surprising part of the research that I did for me. I really never expected to get interested in land or land speculation. At first, I used to just kind of skip over the subject. When I saw them writing about, about this stuff, I thought, you know, I'm not interested in that. But eventually, it became um, really impossible to ignore this aspect of their time in the United States. It was obviously too important a part of their, um, of their lives in America, and in fact, of, I would say, the life of early America to, um, to continue to skip over. So as I, as I followed the emigres and their investments, they began to look like the advance guard of a great incursion into the American hinterland, this flow of European capital pouring into the continental interior. That capital, I came to realize, was a critical element that secured American sovereignty in the back country. It built settlements deep in the continental interior, carved roads connecting those settlements to the port cities along the Atlantic coast. It built flour mills, lumber mills that processed the settlers' wheat and their wood. It extended credit to, to settlers to buy land begin farms and stores where they bought their goods. From the broadest perspective, in fact, the emigres' investments in American land help us to understand how European capital transformed the United States in the late 18th century. Their excursions into the backcountry through what were some of the most contested regions of North America also enmeshed the emigres into very delicate geopolitical issues. As they traveled west, they entered a Franco-Indian world that had existed for more than 200 years by then, a world of French settlers who had intermarried with Indians and formed extensive and highly connected to Franco-Indian Métis world. That world still existed in the West, even after Washington, Hamilton, Madison, and that other crew of friends had drafted and ratified the Constitution. And it was this world that the French and Indians had fought to preserve in the Seven Years' War. It was this complex that they sought to resurrect once again in the 1790s. I'm not going to go into all the details here. I know that um, I've been talking for a little while, um, and we're probably all getting hungry. Uh, you can buy the book right back there if you want to find out everything that happened. But um, suffice it to say that by 1798, diplomatic relations between the United States and France had collapsed. An undeclared war between France and the United States had broken out. Historians today call it the quasi-war. And it was in this context that, the, that Congress passed the Alien and, and Sedition Acts, sharply restricting the rights of immigrants into the United States. In fact, these uh, really infamous laws were passed um, in, uh, in part in response to suspicions that my emigres were spying for France. Volney himself was directly targeted by an expulsion order. And so the emigres fled once again. Talleyrand had already left in 1796. He'd returned to a post-terror France where he was now foreign minister. Liancourt, Volney, Moreau, they all left in 1798. Noailles stayed a little while longer. By then, French authorities had decided that they could no longer depend on the United States, this ally that they had cultivated in the American Revolution. In fact, France, uh, France's ally had abandoned it in his most uh, pressing moment of need declaring neutrality in the bitter war between France and Britain. French authorities determined now in the mid-1790s that they would need to find a more reliable source of provisions for their Caribbean colonies, more dependable bases for naval support. 
When Napoleon took power in France under the influence of Talleyrand and of the ideas that he developed while he was in the United States, France decided to rebuild the French Empire in North America. And so in 1802, having secured the cession of Louisiana from Spain, Napoleon sent um, a force that would eventually total 80,000 troops to Louisiana, to take Louisiana. But before going to Louisiana, they would stop in Saint-Domingue, they would reconquer the island, they would put the freed slaves back into slavery, and they would move from there to New Orleans. And that's actually when Noah finally left Philadelphia. He went down um, uh, and participated in the French mission to reconquer Saint-Domingue. Of course, it didn't work as Napoleon had uh, planned. Under assault by the Haitian forces and by the diseases in the tropical environment, Napoleon lost one of his finest armies. Tens of thousands of French troops died in Saint-Domingue, decimating the army that was meant to secure Louisiana. And this was, I think, um, probably the most remarkable part of the research for me, to learn about uh, these, uh, these extensive connections between American and Haitian history. I won't go into all the details here, but, um, but I'll just say that it became clear to me that the expansion of the United States, the transformation of a young and fragile nation into a continental power, was intimately bound up with the birth of Haiti. You really can't separate American history from the history of the Caribbean. Talleyrand had a hand in the Louisiana Purchase as Napoleon's foreign minister. The transaction was in fact financed by the very people he collaborated with, um, who collaborated with the French emigres in their American land purchases by their hosts in Philadelphia, uh, by William Bingham, with some help from Pierre César Labouchère, that um, enterprising banker who married so well, and with the Bering Bank, which financed um, in large part the Louisiana Purchase. And so it was that the United States gained Louisiana which ensured that at least one part of the United States would continue speaking French right up into the present day. So this brief period from 1793 to 1803 had witnessed um, an extraordinary transformation. Where the United States had once been hemmed in between the Atlantic coast and the Appalachian Mountains, its territory now stretched all the way to the Rocky Mountains. The country was on its way to becoming a global power. And that transformation, I want to suggest to you, can't be fully understood without reference to the dramatic events taking place in, uh, in Europe and the Caribbean. There never was a time when our history wasn't connected to that of the rest of the world, when it wasn't, so to speak, bilingual. And so that was a lesson that I learned while I was um, doing the research and, and writing this book, and it's one that I've been very pleased to share with you this evening. So thank you very much.